anyone who has ever had a child or loved a baby knows that the time of birth is always so full of joy. Well, it isn't always full of joy. In fact, if you have a child that's born prematurely or placed in a high-risk category and ends up in a neonatal clinic, the joy is replaced by fear, anxiety, depression that can last for weeks, months, even years. I want you to meet very special people who join us this morning to help others by sharing their stories with their children, as you can hear. Uh, we want you to meet Linda and Steve Gould. Uh, their daughter, Stephanie, was born prematurely. Matthew, there you go. <laughs> and it resulted in complications. You're seeing Stephanie, she is right here. And uh, thank you for joining us. Nice to have you here. You'll here. tell your story. But also, Linda Sternberg is here. She had an absolutely normal pregnancy, had an induced labor that resulted in Matthew uh, having real complications at birth. And we'll talk about all of that. Are you all right? Are you OK? Huh? Can you tell your story? What happened with Stephanie? Stephanie was born uh, 13 weeks early. She had to be taken because I went into renal failure. I had severe toxemia. It was discovered in my fifth month of pregnancy, and I was hospitalized. Uh, my regular obstetrician was wise enough to transfer me to a doctor who did handle high-risk pregnancies. That was wise. Yes. All right. But you and still had problems. Then, so I was still uh, on strict bed rest, but I did go into renal failure. They had to take Stephanie by C-section. Fortunately. Uh, a week beforehand, they gave me steroid shots to help mature her lungs. That was the problem. They knew that, didn't they? Yes, because they did take an amniocentesis to find out how mature her lungs were. Okay. And she, the, now her complications are slight cerebral palsy, is that right? Very uh, mild CP in her left side. And at uh, three, di uh, three days after she was born, she developed a brain bleed, <laughs> which is a hemorrhage. And because of it, uh, excessive cerebral fluid accumulated on her brain. They did do serial spinal taps on her, but it wasn't sufficient. And then so they put a shunt in her They brain, put a shunt they? in. But that developed in complications too, right, Steve? Uh, the shunt can malfunction. And uh, one of our greatest fears is when somebody tells you you're going to have neurosurgery at, and the baby's only two weeks old and they're two pounds tops, you start to uh, question yourself whether or not you're making the right moves. Oh, yeah. And uh, eventually we had to put the shunt in because there was no other way. But then we brought her home, and three days after we had her home, it malfunctioned. Mm. And that's one of your worst fears when you have a shunt, that something's going to go wrong. It's one thing to make decisions when you're clear-headed. I wonder how you even made them. You could have lost both Linda and Stephanie. Steve, what's that like to go through? Well, in my case, it may have been a little different than most people. Right after the baby was born, they couldn't stop the edema from producing in Linda's body. So they had to put Linda into an intensive care unit. So I had Stephanie in intensive care, and then I had Linda in intensive care. And I was just wandering in the dock, running from Beth Israel over to Children's, back to Beth Israel over to Children's. And uh, at that time, you needed, the nurses at Children's were fantastic. They were the ones that really comforted me, plus the family. You had to really reach out. Mm -hmm. And that's basically how we got involved with Nick With your support, support group, which we'll talk about. But Linda, equal time here. Now, your husband, Richard, <laughs> is in Europe, but he had to go away. So you're here alone with Matthew. But it's odd. You had an absolutely normal pregnancy and still had problems. What happened? Uh, Matthew was my <clears throat> second child. I have a son, Michael, who was four and a half at the time. Um, I was induced a week before my due date because I was very, very large, very uncomfortable, and I was dilated. And my labor progressed very normally, and when I went to deliver him, I couldn't get him out. And He was a face presentation. He was a face. Most babies are born head down. He was right. looking up to the sky, and forceps were applied, which fractured his skull. And the skull fracture caused bleeding into his brain and out of his belly button, his ears, and his navel. Did you think he'd live at that time? I was under general anesthesia, so I was very foggy. My husband, my parents saw him live through those first few moments and were terrorized because at first they really didn't. Do you want mommy? <laughs> did not think that he would survive. Yeah, mama. <laughs> they didn't think. And then once he was stabilized, they were very concerned if there would be brain damage because there had been so much bleeding into his brain. And it was really touch and go for a while. 
How, was... how do you uh, treat a child normally? You get Matthew home uh, from the hospital. You get Stephanie home from the hospital after all the horror you go through day to day. But then how do you act normally toward your child? I mean, you had an incident with your husband, didn't you? My husband, well, I knew what it was like to have a child at home. And I knew what it was like to respond to a, a child. And I watched my husband respond with my first child. And when Matthew got home, my husband wouldn't touch him. You know, and I said to him, remember how you used to throw Michael up in the air and bounce him around? And I said, I can't with Matthew, I'm afraid. And it took him a long time to be able to wrestle with him and do the kinds of things that he, he does normally. But he did. I mean, but ultimately, he did. he did. Do you live in the fear that these children will die because they are yes. born? I mean, yes. How do you cope with that? Uh, it's a fear that I still have. I would um, be in her room constantly making sure she was breathing because she did go through a lot of apnea and bradycardia in the hospital. Explain that. That is when um, either they stop breathing or their uh, breathing slows down just before they stop breathing. So and is she that did. like Sid, sudden infant death? That's, that is similar yes, yes, it is. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, I was afraid that she was going to die. How about now, Linda? Now I know that she's doing well. I worry about the shunt. The shunt can malfunction any time. This is the shunt in her brain that relieves the pressure. The pressure, right? yes. Right. And it has malfunctioned twice before. Four, four days after we had her home, we had to rush it to Children's, and they revised the shunt. Um, two months later, she was back again because um, the communication between the two ventricles had dried up. So it was relieving the pressure in the Just right. Just to understand that, is it fair to say that yours is an ongoing problem with Stephanie's health, but yours is fairly resolved, Linda? Ours is resolved, but each milestone that he achieves, I breathe a sigh of relief. I mean, we have been told by our neurologist, my pediatrician, a physical therapist, all of the follow-up people who saw him immediately after he was home that he is perfectly normal and his development should be perfectly normal. How but do you avoid laying blame? It's hard. Who do you blame? I think you, you think about what you did or didn't do during your pregnancy, which in my case had nothing to do with it, but I think you do mm -hmm. try to blame yourself. And but if somebody if had really measured your pelvis or, or noticed the position of that child, it would have been different, wouldn't it? I mean, I'm not trying to lay it all on the doctor, no. but how, I guess I'm asking you how you feel about that. Uh, at this point, I feel that Matthew is a miracle, and we thank God every moment that he's fine, and I feel like we've resolved it because he is so fine, and we've tried to put that behind us and not make an issue out of it. You don't want to talk then about what it was like in the first few days. How about for you? Who do you blame? I don't. I blame myself. Why? Because um, I'm the one that was very sick. I had the toxemia. They had to take Stephanie. Yeah, but that's not your fault. I mean, you well, don't... at the beginning, I did. I did feel it was my fault, and it was very stressful. And I feel better about the whole situation now. But the doctors and the nurses were wonderful. They did all they could. And your family. You all pulled together. And yes. That, that is what yes. is so important. Yes. Let's take a break and invite Dr. Elizabeth Brown, who deals with neonatal care so very well. Uh, she'll join us, and we'll talk about this wonderful support group, especially how I think men get through this, because it's rarely talked about. We'll be right back. Linda and Steve Gould are with us. They are parents of Stephanie, who was uh, born C-section and had some real complications, a high-risk baby. We've taken the children off the set so that we can talk because of the noise, but <laughs> we'll bring them back in a moment. Linda Sternberg, her son Matthew, was uh, a forcep delivery and had complications that were very severe. Good news is that both of these children are here. And we've invited Dr. Elizabeth Brown. She is the director of the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Boston City Hospital. You do such good work. And you can explain medically some of these things. The difference between a preemie and a high-risk baby. Well, premature means that you're born before the due date of the baby. So if a normal baby should be born at about 37 to 40 weeks gestation, then a premature baby is one born before 37 weeks gestation. Don't they automatically become the high-risk? Not automatically. Many babies who are born between about 35 and 37 weeks are perfectly healthy, except that they're smaller. They don't have breathing problems, and they really do very well. Whereas babies who are born as prematurely as Linda's baby uh, almost always have the kinds of problems that Stephanie had. High risk means that there's some problem either with the mother in terms of, of say, diabetes or hypertension or some disease state that the mother has that influences the course of the pregnancy and makes that pregnancy high risk. 
other kinds of things that, that make a pregnancy high risk or, or obstetric complications, such as, as what Linda yeah. had in terms of the, wrong, the baby facing the wrong way. And you lead me to the obvious, medical intervention. Which side are you on, the side of intervention or the side of the miracle of life, just let it happen? Well, I think I'm in the middle, which is sort of an unfair way to put it, but I think that intervention is justified if the outcome, in other words, the benefit is, worse, is better than the risk. Every intervention carries a risk. For instance, if you do an amniocentesis, there's a small chance that you could kill the baby by putting the needle in. So that you have to be willing to take that chance in order to get the benefit. And the benefit, for instance, would be finding out if the baby's lungs are mature, mm. and if they're not mature, being able to give a medication that would help them become mature before, before birth. How do you feel about medical intervention? I think it, in my case, it worked out very well. Stephanie wouldn't be here without it, is that how you I, feel? Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, they, uh, they did an amnio and then they, from the amnio, they found out that they could give her some steroids and they gave her some shots of beta-methasone which helped Stephanie's lungs develop to the point that when she was born that she did start breathing on her own and it wasn't until like five, six minutes afterwards that she needed the ventilator. But I don't think she would be here unless they did that. Without mm -hmm. the steroids, she wouldn't yeah. have lived at all. How about you, Linda? How do you feel about the medical side? I feel side? very strongly that without medical intervention and immediate medical intervention, as Matthew was being delivered, if he had not been rushed to Children's immediately and then back to Brigham and Women's, he wouldn't have survived. But if he hadn't been forceps in the beginning, he wouldn't have needed to be he rushed wouldn't. to Children's. So there is, you really do find yourself in the middle when you deal with something like this, don't you? Do you find parents just have a real heck of a time getting through this? I think it's awful. It, it's sort of like getting hit by a car in a way. I mean, it's, it's a major crisis in your life that you didn't expect. Um, and the, you have to then bring into play all the resources that you have around you. And if you happen to be lucky and have good family supports and lots of people around who can help you, you have a better time of it. But there's so many people who go through this who are single parents, who are young, you know, your teenage pregnancies who really have no one to give them that kind of support. And that must be even a worse crisis. Is that the reason for the support group? And I would think it benefits, the, forgive me, I don't mean this in a sexist way at all, but it seems that men always find themselves in a position like you did in a way, Steve, mm -hmm. running back and forth. I can't show emotion, I have to be the strong one. So how do you vent it through this group? Uh, men basically have always been, you grow up saying, don't show your emotion. Mm. Uh, don't show anybody else your emotion. Even though you may be scared, you may be fearful of the outcome on both sides, you've got to keep up that image. Uh, you have to let that emotion out. And at the point, I think the nurses help, the doctors help, your family helps. But really, the person that really can help you the most is somebody who's already been through it. Exactly. And at that point, when we were going through it, there really wasn't anybody in that first week that I came in contact with. And I think after we finally got through the whole three months of being in the hospital, we both said to each other, boy, we'd like to help somebody during that crisis. And that's what we've been doing for the past two years. So NICU does, a, that's the support group. They do a beautiful job of matching up. For instance, you would, you would be matched with someone who had a with preemie a with a lung problem or a shunt, right? right. Correct. And for you, Linda? Um, a full-term baby that has some sort of a problem. So you all sit around in a group and talk and air your feelings like the feelings of guilt or whatever your or sa sadness? Well, there are a couple of different facets to the program. There are hospital visits where we go in and talk to any parent who has a baby in the NICU. And Linda goes into Children's and I go to Brigham and Women's. And then we go up to the maternity floors and talk to mothers and fathers up there. And it's just a wonderful way for them to be able to let something go because we're right in between. I found that I had the medical people who were wonderful. We had the most phenomenal neonatologist, Dr. Ann Stark, who was fabulous, but she was like the medical bad guy. You know, she told me the, the things to be afraid of. And I had my family and friends on the other side who were wonderful, who gave me the support, but they were so emotionally involved with me. And the only in-between person I had was my pediatrician. Dr. Leslie Silverstone, who, yeah. was, who was so in between, but I could have used somebody who was not medically or emotionally involved. Well, we need somebody to put it in lay terms of understanding, saying, I've been there, they told me this too, and, and it's all right, it worked out. Is that, Dr. Brown, what we need? I think so, and also it, it gives you a perspective on the long term. When you're dealing with a baby who day to day may die, I mean, that's all you can focus on. Mm -hmm. You need somebody that comes in and say, just hang on, get through this period of time. 
because down the line things are going to work out. Mm -hmm. Not that they're going to work out perfectly. I think none of us are perfect. We all have different problems. But Do you prepare parents for the fact that it may not work out? Yes. There might be learning disabilities, a whole host of things, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. And I think we try to balance the risks in the long term with also the things that may work out well. Um, it's not fair to say to a parent everything's going to be wonderful when in fact because of the problems the baby's had there are likely to be problems down the line. What we need to do is to make it clear to parents what the problems are, what kind of follow-up needs the baby's going to have, and then what resources are around to help them. And there are a lot of resources in this state to help people with babies with problems. Let's do two, a two-parter here. Prevention. If there's a pregnant woman watching, what should she know? And what can she do? Are there cases where she can't do anything? There are cases where you can't do anything, but about 80% of the time there's some clue that something can be done. At the first sign of, of labor contractions, if they're happening early, even though you say it can't possibly be in labor, call your doctor. Mm. Because if, in fact, you're having early contractions, that's the time to go in and try to stop the contractions. There are medicines that can do that. Okay. And if you're going to go into premature labor, even if you can stop them for a little while, there are ways, as with Dr. McClendon, to try and, and help enhance the maturation of the baby's lungs so things are better when the baby is born early. Um, and then any complications such as hypertension that, that come along can be dealt with. Prenatal care is one of the biggest things you can do to help prevent problems in pregnancy. And then on the side of support, I mean, what do you say to people? If it does happen, there's, there's, there's life after it happening. You've got two children here who are miracles, right? right? It, miracles. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. This is what awesome. we tell them. There's no emotion that you feel that's wrong. And that's no. something that I've really stressed Boy, to Boy, is people. that a good thing that you mm -hmm. say. Let's give an address to you. Can we do it? N-I-C-U. Parents Support Incorporated, 84 Hinkley Road in Milton, 02186, and the phone number is 698-1172. And here's Grandma, Nana, <laughs> Nana, <laughs> just brought in Matthew and Stephanie. That's okay, Carolyn's out there taking care of Stephanie, but Matthew is a miracle, and you all are wonderful people to share what you share. You know, I, I love all the things you said. You give great hope to all of us. Thanks an awful lot. Thank, thank you for having us. Really, this. thank you, and good luck. God bless. We'll be right back with more Good Day. Diane Carroll, also known as Donnie Stee's Dominique Devereaux, talks about her life and her book next on Good Day.